the continuation of torts and a discussion on causation. However, um, just to bring you up to speed, if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing and liking. It helps the algorithm. Uh, these videos are not monetized, so you won't see ads on them, I hope. And um, so basically what we have going on here is a review, an expansion of Emerson Bar Review. And today I thought that we would take an actual uh, exam um, question from the California Bar. And look at it. Now, if you're in law school and you're not in uh, taking the bar, I, it would really help just to review past exams anyway because, uh, you know, you pay attention to what your professor wants and it's probably a little different than what the bar wants. But I will tell you that there were some things they didn't cover in law school that were on the bar exam. But uh, some of the bar review courses actually have that. So what we want to do is look at um, past exams. Okay, now, uh, last time I mentioned that there was a 1998 uh, torts question that I found, and I found it in a Fleming's book on torts that he had an outline for and in the outline it's a little different than what Emerson taught and it has some a lot of things that Emerson doesn't have so um, I'm trying to find the pet uh, past exams okay past exams questions and answers okay so 2015 June uh, question three is what we're going to look at from actually the California baby bar, which there is overlap in the California baby bar exams and the regular bar. So either way, and uh, I was looking at this 2015 one, and on question three, it covers a lot of the stuff we just reviewed. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, go over that at the end because I'm gonna cover a couple of things that I didn't cover in the last video and are not on Emerson, but you are probably going to be required to know. Um, I mean, you'll score more points if you cite it. So what, remember we talked about causation needing actual but for cause, actual factual. Uh, the names uh, change depending on jurisdictions or or custom but um, there's two prongs and they say oh well, you can't have causation if you don't have these two prongs uh, put them down as A and B and the, the uh, terminology now they do have a, a test that can substitute for but for in the actual cause now with the proximate cause, that's the area I didn't go over as much, but I'm going to kind of add a little bit more into the actual cause for you this time. So basically, actual cause is normally a prerequisite, but sometimes they, uh, as a general rule, it's a burden, the burden of proof is a preponderance of the evidence uh, that the plaintiff, the person complaining, has to prove it. Okay, uh, by preponderance of the evidence, not by a reasonable doubt, but by a preponderance of, of the evidence. So the the uh, the level's a little bit lower than in criminal court, but uh, it can really rack up a lot of debt for somebody who's accused, even if it doesn't put them away. So the cause, in fact, or the but for cause, right? Sometimes you can't really prove it. Summers versus Tice, uh, I used last time to describe uh, where there was a concurrent cause and um, the burden of proof had shifted. Uh, the judge decided uh, this uh, substantial factor test. Uh, both, 
basically it, he, he, he's just like, we can't prove it, but we know either one of the two of you did. You're jointly liable. Now, fast forward to market share liability and burden of proof. Now, market share is a concept uh, where you have more than one product on the market that could be negligent or companies, when you're dealing with companies, uh, multiple companies that are selling something and they can't prove which company did it. And one of the uh, famous cases was Seindel Abbott Labs versus Abbott Labs. And this was a DES prescription that was given to mothers and it wound up causing their children reproductive harm, especially the girls. And uh, the girls would get reproductive cancer. And so uh, when they went to court to sue for damages, you know, after this uh, harm, and actually uh, they've taken it off the market, but um, the courts held that the manufacturer um, had to prove, it shifted the burden of proof, that it was not the supplier of the DES. Now, you, you need to understand that this is not the only uh, decision, the only court, and there's been other cases like New York Heimowitz versus Eli Lilly and Company where California uh, rejected the market share liability theory. Um, wait a minute. I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. So basically, uh, this was, uh, California had rejected the market sh share liability for soft, soft polio. And this is in the California Reporter. Okay, and it's an 83 case. So um, this is where, like, basically... If you're actually practicing law, what you want to do is you want to shepherdize your cases and then look at other relevant cases. Shepherdizing is simply looking at the case history, looking at the most recent history, and then look, looking at uh, cases as, as close as you can to your jurisdiction where uh, the court has authority. So medical uncertainty, medical malpractice, and share of liability, again, Herskovitz versus Group Health, even though this patient had a 50-50% a chance of survival, the chance was reduced by 14% through negligent. So this is the market share, another sort of spin on the market share. And the court basically uh, allowed the court to use the substantial factor test. Okay, so in the first case, remember, right? said you can't have causation unless you meet the first prong but they will allow substitution sometimes for a substantial factor test okay and this is going to be applied in place of actual cause now emerson kind of goes through everything sort of fast and uh, Maybe your classes did as well, but if you slow down, reread things, and, you know, just practice, you'll, you'll get it. It'll click. It just, it's a lot to keep track of. Now, with the proximate cause, we talked about Big Me. I'm not going to go over that. It was about independent intervening things. You can watch the other video on that. And it also talked about public policies and changes in policies that have been coming up. And I took snippets from that. But I wanted to uh, go into the proximate cause domino theory a little bit because uh, there's this direct causation when there's no intervening acts. Um, it just sort of snowballs, if you will. So there's two seminal torts case that you should know for 1L torts in the USA, and they are cases that are from uh, UK or other English-speaking countries, I think Wales, and they're old. Now, there's the Palmas and the Wagon 
uh, Wagon One case. Okay. And you'd be surprised how much stuff you can store in your mind if you can just find a place to put it and deep breathe and concentrate, get enough rest, process the information you will you'll be able to remember. You you just I mean, I know that it can be overwhelming at times. Torts is really huge. I mean, it is got a long case history. So the Palomas case is basically a minority rule where the defendant is held liable for all direct cause damages. Now, I found conveniently that Wikipedia has the actual case, and we can go take a quick peek at it. And that way, um, you can... Now, I'm going to leave this open because... No, wait, that's not the page. I want it... This is what I'm going to leave open, okay? I don't want to download it. I have too much stuff on my computer. So, um, let's go over here. And let's go get this case real quick now. Just, it's sort of a nutshell case. We're not going to read the actual entire case. But it's English tort case on causation, remoteness in the law. And America, as I've explained in other videos, uses a sort of a mashup of laws, but foundational is a lot of the old English law. And uh, it's kind of natural for that to occur. But again, there might be a little bit of French depending on the jurisdiction, like if you go to Louisiana or if you go to uh, areas that have Sp had Spanish, a lot of Spanish colonists, uh, like Mexico or, um, not Mexico, I mean Texas. Texas and California used to be part of Mexico. Think about the American-Mexican War. Anyway, so negligence. Okay, so this has to do with negligence. We're talking about negligence. We're talking about causation and the remoteness of the plaintiff. Okay? <clears throat> Again, you can go look at this. You can Google it yourself. Um, you can pause this and then write down the URL if you want to go more in depth. I'm just going to go over it. And notice how they put the Donahue, Stevenson, and the Wagon Mound number one case. So this was a landmark decision. So the Court of Appeal held that the defendant can be deemed liable for all consequences flowing from his negligent conduct, regardless of how unforeseeable such consequences are. The case is an example of strict liability, a concept that has generally fallen out of favor. And notice how they're spelling this. They're spelling it in the English spelling. This is not American English. In American English, you would spell it without the U. Just... Uh, America, American dictionaries, American English is slightly different than UK English. Okay, so with the common law courts, the case may now be considered bad law, having been superseded by a landmark de landmark decisions of Donahue and the Wagon Mound. Okay, so these are the cases that you want to know because they're also applying in the United States courts. So this was majority strict liability, and um, basically they were taken to arbitration, and this was about a plank falling, and it caused a fire, and um, the Court of Appeal affirmed it. And um, so basically, um, even though it wasn't, foreseeable, it was held that the defendant would nevertheless be liable for all direct consequences of his actions. And so, although Steve Doerr would have foreseen the careless loading might cause some damages to the worker's cargo in the ship beyond probability, so um, if you look at this, um, it's sort of similar to false graph, but it's, it's turning on the um, causation as well and it is cited in cases in America so okay now 
basically they, they dropped a plank by mistake and it had a domino effect to start a fire and they were held strictly liable. So let's go now. Um, so that's minority now. Now the wagon mound is now majority, but the minority used to be the majority, but now the minority is the majority is the minority. Does that make sense? So, okay. Let's go to this case. This is another um, sort of ship type case. And um, it's uh, Overseas Tank Ship UK Limited versus Mort's Dock and Engineering Company Limited. Okay, so it's a majority rule requirement for reasonably foreseeable consequences. And again, we're looking at causation and the domino effect. Okay, it's not enough to just cause, to have the but for cause or the actual cause or its substitute the substantial factor test, but now you have to prove proximate cause or legal cause, okay? And so these these are some of the decisions for which the newer theories are based on. And let's take a peek at this case because you ought to know these two cases and you can call them that way. We're going to read a uh, actual a bar question that was for um, the one else and uh, the baby bar, but again, the, the California bar uh, recycles some of their questions and they do it in between the two, two bars. And it's used from the National Conference of Bar Examiners. Okay, so Overseas Tank Ship UK Limited Mort Stock. Okay, it's commonly known as the Wagon Mound Number 1. It's a landmark tort case. Okay, these landmark decisions change the precedent. What's going to be uh, the overarching uh, policy or uh, what's going to guide their decisions? So that's why you're shepherdizing your cases. You're looking at the history. What's, what are we doing now? Let's get with the program. Let's have continuing education. So basically, this is the remoteness rule for causation and negligence. Okay, remember we had several theories of tort, and then there's categories and theories within the theories. So right now we're covering the idea of negligence. Uh, we might move over to products liability, and we might move over to uh, intentional torts. Okay. Negligence is not necessarily intelligence, it's just carelessness. Uh, um, not intelligence, excuse me, it's intent. Intent, intentional, unintentional, mistake, uh, accidental. Um, so who's going to pay? You did this, you came in, and it caused this, and but for this. Well, but for is not enough even if you caused it, uh, even if you were deemed negligent, or if we're going to substitute, they also want a legal cause, a proximate cause. Okay, so the Privy, Privy Council held that a party can be held liable only for loss that was reasonably foreseeable, and that's what I just said. And I think people learn better from repetition. Just go over it, rote learning, write it down, take notes, and then active learning. So you learn a lot from active learning. So go look the case up. So I don't recall being taught that in law school. And um, I was looking through my um, books that I got from this uh, Flemings, which has 1L support and law school exam support and it also has bar review baby bar review and it's based out of california and so uh one of the outlines that they gave me had that in it in the torch section so they're at this url if you want to pause and look at it if you want to use it 
another one I used and reviewed and got some of my information from aside from law school was Barmax and Barmax has excellent app and lifetime support like if you have to take the bar more than once and um, they have an app and you can do multiple choice questions I called it Aptibar and when I called them at the time this is the, the Barmax basic website because they do more than just bar stuff they do LSAT prep, 1L, GRE, and other things. So, okay, they have professors there or different people there that help you um, sort of, not necessarily tutor, but they have like, if you go in and you log in and you buy something on the Barmax, they actually have a section in there that you can go in on your computer and they have videos of I actually belong to it. I don't know if you've noticed it on my browser, but uh, let's take a look at my browser real quick. I think it's on this one. See this here? That's the Bar Max. Okay, I have the complete California Bar Review in there. And uh, it has all the subjects, but if you log in, and I can't, for probably for reasons, they have all these videos in there, and they have like, um, some of their professors or tutors in there and they will give you um, motivational talks. They'll talk about uh, strategies. Um, sometimes they'll review uh, certain sections, but it's different than I also had the um, Barbary online, but I don't know why they cut me off. I think they, um, I had them for 1L, that was it. And um, I thought I had like lifetime I could go in there, but it looks like they got bought out by somebody. Anyway, so um, let's get back. Okay, so next time we're going to go over damages a little bit more. But um, I decided that I didn't think that Emerson was enough. And um, I, I went and cross-referenced, like I said. And I do highly suggest if you are taking the bar exam or even if you're struggling with 1L that you think about getting some support from other outside sources because it's really a lot. A lot of people need um, to go the extra mile, to spend lots of time in the library, spend lots of extra hours researching and reading because it's complex. And it can get kind of confusing, you know? Wait, I just read this, but why is this here? Okay, so let's take a look at the question three. Okay, again, this is um, from the California Bar. If you want to watch this over and over, you can. It's a lot to digest at once. I'm just going to go through this and then read off the two model answers, maybe make a little commentary, and then um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to go because uh, I, I can go over the other areas, like the damages, in, in more in depth. Okay, but this is a case that you might get on the California bar and it has been given before but this was given on the baby bar so it probably won't be given again for a really long time on the baby bar but it just illustrates the kind of question you might get in law school or you might get uh, even as a lawyer to analyze uh, and, and look at and, and determine what are the issues you pull the issues out when you brief the case you pull out the issues, you do an analysis, you look at the chances or the probability of winning the case or, you know, which way it can go, if it's 50-50 or whatever. Okay, so, uh, and that would also cause you to know whether or not you want to even take a case. You know, are you in comparative negligence or contrib negligence state? If you're in contrib, oh boy. Okay, so Tommy is, a four is 14 years old. Tommy plays golf every day at his local golf course using a golf cart. Although children are generally not allowed to rent carts at this course, Tommy has a special relationship with the owners of the course who consider him to be unusual, of unusual maturity. He's generally allowed to use the golf courts as long as they are available. One day while driving a cart from the first to the second hole of the golf course, Tommy failed to watch where he was going and ran into Dana as she was swinging her golf club. Because of the accident, Dana's shot left. 
the golf course and the ball fell into an air intake at a nearby power plant, causing it to seize operations. The power plant had failed to attach the required screen on the intake where it opened the plant. Perry lives 10 miles from the golf course. He relies on a constant supply of oxygen in order to stay alive. When the power plant shut down, Perry's equipment stopped supplying the needed oxygen. He suffered brain damage. What possible tort causes of action does Perry have against Tommy? Discuss. That's the question. It's a pretty short fact pack pattern. Some of them are much longer. Okay, now let's go look at the answers. Okay, so that was question three. Is this just the... Oh, I guess this is the one without the answers. Okay, let's go back. Hold on. Uh, examination questions. Okay, let's go to the answers. If you want to pause that and do a practice question, if you're practicing for the bar, um, that's you can go ahead and pause it. I'm going to go get the answers. Performance sense and answers. Okay, wait a minute. Students exam questions. I've always mistake hit the questions and not the questions and the answers. So um, when you when you pull this off, do the one with the questions and the answers so you can get the answers that that had passed. Um, I'm just scrolling through fast because I'm pressed for time. I don't know about you. Okay, so we have to get over um, three. Uh, come on. Which question is that? Oh, that's it. So the answers, you have to go through the answers. Um, the answers are after each of them. They usually have an A and a B answer. Um, I'm going to question three because this is really a good question. I mean, it really, it's really small, but it packs a big punch. You've got that other plaintiff. Sorry about this. This is live. And I really don't have time to edit. Okay, so this is what we just read. Question three. It's on page 31. Now, uh, here's the first one. They just wrote at the top, is Tommy liable for ne in negligence to Perry for his damages? In order for Perry to succeed in his negligence claim against Tommy, he has to prove every element of negligence, duty, standard of care, breach, causation, and damages by a preponderance of the evidence. Duty. Did Tommy owe a duty of care to Perry? In other words, did Tommy have to conform to a certain standard of care to prevent and avoid unreasonable risk of harm to Perry? General duty rule. In the majority view, Cardoza view, is you, if, if, excuse me, the defend, a defendant owes a duty of reasonable care only to foreseeable plaintiffs in the zone of danger, created by the negligence of the defendant. If the minority view, Andrew's view, is used, everyone owes a duty of reasonable care to the world at large to exercise reasonable care to avoid unreasonable harm of risks to others. In this case, Tommy did owe a duty of reasonable care to Perry if the minority view is used because he was engaged in the game of golf and he hit the ball that could reasonably hit someone and cause damage. If the majority view is used, then it would be difficult to establish that duty, because Perry lived 10 miles away from the golf course. <clears throat> Excuse me. Assuming that the minority view is mute, used, then duty is established. Okay, do you notice how this person is writing issue, rule, analysis, conclusion? You have to show your work. You have to tie the fact pattern back in and elements and you have to do it fast you have to do it within an hour okay standard of care generally the standard of care is that of a reasonable prudent person of the same physical capabilities same age same skills or knowledge and in this like circumstances in this case since Tommy is 14 he would be held to the standard of a 14 year old in the same physical capabilities skills experience and like circumstances in other words under normal circumstances he would be held to the standard of care of a 14-year-old who plays golf. However, because he was driving a cart, he would be held to the standard of an adult who plays golf and drives a golf court cart. Excuse me. Breach. Breach is an unreasonable conduct. In other words, a defendant would breach his duty 
when his conduct falls below the standard of care and it could be established by the use of one reasonable unreasonable conduct test to negligence per se three re ipsa loquitur in this case the unreasonable conduct test would be applied to determine breach and we can also use the learned hand test to address the breach did tommy fall fail to act reasonably toward perry Tommy was driving a golf cart that is generally reserved for use by adults. However, the owner, owner of the golf course had allowed him to use it even though it is deemed an adult activity. While driving the cart, Tommy failed to watch that he was gonna, going to, as a result of which he ran into another player, Dana, when she was swinging her golf club. In other words, Tommy failed to pay attention while driving a cart, which is a motorized vehicle, and by failing to pay attention, he ran into Dana. Using the unreasonable conduct test, it would be established that he failed to act unreasonably while driving a motorized vehicle when he did not pay attention where he was going. By using the learned hand test, B, uh, LP, we can also, we could also establish whether the burden on him to pay attention while driving a cart was less than the likelihood of harming someone times the seriousness of the harm while considering the social utility of the activity. This is the probability. Now Emerson goes over that concept uh, as well. And um, okay, so driving a cart in a golf course is very common and almost every player uses one to get from one hole to the to another thus the social util utility is established now this is sort of a conclusion um but he he writes however when driving a cart the likelihood of running into another player or another cart is also high if one is not paying attention and or is distracted for any reason once the driver runs into someone, there is a good chance of causing damages to property and or the other person who is engaged in the game or driving another cart. Since carts do not go very fast, the magnitude is not as high as driving a regular car on the streets. Nevertheless, the driver of a car has to use care to avoid unreasonable risk of harm to others. The burden on the defendant to drive carefully and slowly while paying attention to where he is going is far less than the harm that could be caused by driving carelessly causing accident. By the way, this doesn't have to be perfect English. Um, and then it says, thus breach is established. Okay, causation. Do you see how this is going through very detailed and carefully? This is a good answer. Uh, it's it's kind of long, but this is what you need to do. You need to break it apart. Causation, the plaintiff must also prove that the defendant's negligent act was but the actual and proximate cause of his injury, more or less. Okay, that definition, I didn't like it, but, you know, that's good enough. Actual cause, in order to show that there was a causal relationship between the act of the defendant and the injury suffered by the plaintiff, we can use the but-for test. In other words, but for Tommy running accidentally into Dana, her ball would not have left the golf course and fall into her, the air intake of the power plant, causing the electricity to be seized. Ceased, excuse me, that the power plant to be shut down that led to the oxygen to be cut off for Perry, who suffered damages. Are you seeing a domino theory here? I am. Okay, proximate cause. Even if P could show the actual cause, he still could show that the act of the defendant was the legal or proximate cause of the injury. In other words, the injury suffered by P, the foreseeable consequences of D's act, that he could have reasonably foreseen with no superseding intervening act that would cut off his liability. And then he puts question mark next to it. Was the injury suffered by the P a foreseeable consequences of D's act? This would be very difficult to establish because of the remote of its remoteness. In other words, there are two intervening acts, events, 
that have to be addressed that may or may not cut off the defendant's liability depending on the many factors that would be discussed below. Intervening act event. Any act or event, act of God or of a third party or animal that occurs after D's act that combined with the act of D would be the cause of the injury suffered by the plaintiff. In this case, there was first the intervening act of Dana's golf course, the golf ball leaving the golf course and falling into the air and take power plant. This was a dependent intervening act. The answer is yes, because there are other golf players who are on the golf course that Tommy could have run into as a result of his negligence when driving the cart. Was the intervening act a foreseeable one? Yes, because as noted above, the golfers are on the golf course playing and hitting their balls. And if hit by another cart, it's reasonably foreseeable that the ball would go into a different direction than it is intended. And it also is foreseeable that the other golfer herself or himself may miss the intended target and hit the ball elsewhere than is intended. The next question to ad address is whether the injury suffered by the plaintiff was foreseeable or unforeseeable. If foreseeable, then liability is present because the intervening act was dependent and the injury was foreseeable. However, if unforeseeable, like in this case, was it the type of injury that was unforeseeable or the extent of it? The extent would not be an issue based on the eggshell concept. Uh, you know, this person passed, so isn't it the eggshell plaintiff or whatever? I mean, this is all close enough. However, if the type of it is unforeseeable, it would depend on whether Paloma's jurisdiction is available or wagon mound jurisdiction. If Paloma's is used, then as long as the defendant's acts was his direct cause, and then the type of injury, even if it is unforeseeable, the liability is present. However, if the wagon mound is used, then only the foreseeable injury would cause the liability. In this case, the factor that the questions of the liability of the defendant is that Perry has a special problem that requires 24 hours use of oxygen. Although this is not an unusual condition, the fact that the way and the manner in which caused the failure of the power was fairly unusual and too remote because he lived 10 miles away from the golf course and it would be an impossibility for a golf ball, ball go that far to hit a person and injure him. The only way Perry was injured was because the power failure that cut off his electricity and thus his oxygen. The next intervening act or event was the air intake of the power plant, not having a screen to prevent anything from falling into the machine that caused the failure. Thus, the second intervening act was a failure of the power plant that is reasonably unforeseeable and the independent that does not cut off liability of the D. D for defendant, I suppose. In other words, had the power plant placed a screen over the air intake of the machine, the ball would not have fallen inside the power causing the power failure. The negligent act of the power plant is this superseding intervening act that would cut off the liability of Tommy. Harm. Perry did certainly suffer a cognizable harm as evidenced by the fact of the case because after his oxygen was cut off by the power failure in the area, he suffered brain damages. Defenses. Although in a negligent act, the D may exercise contributory negligence, comparative fault, and assumption of risk. In this case, it would be very difficult to assume that Perry was in any way contributing to his injury or assume the risk or it was comparatively at fault. However, if one assumes that he was so dependent on his oxygen that he could have taken other precautionary measures such as having a reserve tank of oxygen just in case if there is a power failure or that the tank runs out or to have backup power source, then he may be comparatively at fault, in which case his recovery would be reduced by the percentage of his fault. Now, this person underlined it for the convenience of the reader, and that might be uh, quite a uh, 
feet because it looks like their answer is a full five pages long. Anyway, it says, if in the jurisdiction contributory negligence is applied, he's found liable. He would be barred from recovery if his contributory negligence was in any way the proximate cause of his injury. Assumption of care would not apply because he did not knowingly assume the specific risk of harm he suffered. Now, that's very wordy. Okay, let's look at the other answer. Perry versus Tommy, negligence. Negligence can be established by showing duty, breach of duty, causation, and damages. Duty. Under the majority rule, general duty of care is owed to all possible tortfeasors. However, the majority rule states that a duty is owed to all foreseeable tortfeasors within the zone of danger. In this case, we're being tried. In a jurisdiction following the minority rule, a very strong argument could be made that given Perry lived 10 miles from the golf course, he was not within the zone of danger, and Tommy would owe no duty to Perry. We will assume that this, jur that in, that this is in a jurisdiction following the majority rule, and that Tommy owes Perry a general duty of care. Now, do you notice in this one, he does not say Andrews, he does not say Cardozo. He just mentions the buzzwords, majority rule, zone of danger. This is much more succinct. This is a passing answer. This is a bar answer that passes. Just to let you know, okay? He's applying the facts to the parent. Breach of duty. Breach of duty can be established using negligence per se, re ipsa loquitur, the learned hand theory, and by using the reasonably prudent person test. In this situation, the reasonably prudent person test applies best. So he doesn't say why. He just says because... Wait, let me finish this up. Because Tommy is only 14, his standard of care will be measured against a child of similar age, experience, and intelligence. However, when a child is engaged in an adult activity, there will be the adult standard of care. Because we are told at the golf course where Tommy was, children are not generally allowed to rent carts on the course. It could be considered an adult activity, and therefore Tommy should be held to the standard of care of a reasonably prudent adult. Tommy may assert the argument driving a golf cart is not specifically an adult activity, like driving a car or operating equipment. However, because the golf course limited the driving of golf carts to adults only, it would be considered an adult activity in this situation, and he would therefore be held to the standard of an adult. There is an argument to be made that perhaps a reasonably prudent adult may have failed to watch where he was going while driving the golf cart, causing him to run into Dana. However, a stronger argument can be made that a reasonably prudent adult knows that when they're driving a golf cart on the course, where there are likely to be other players, they should be paying at special attention to their surroundings. Therefore, it can be said that Tommy breached his duty owed. Causation. For Perry to be successful, in his cause of action, it must be shown Tommy was the actual and proximate cause of his injuries. Actual cause. For Tommy to be the actual cause of Perry's injuries, it must be shown that but for his negligence, Perry would not have been injured. But for Tommy failing to watch where he was going as a result, hitting Dana, causing the ball to go into the air and taking the power plant, Perry would not have lost the power to his equipment, which supplied him the oxygen. However, had, po had power plant attached the required screen, screen on their intake, the golf ball would not have fallen into the air intake. Had Tommy not failed to watch where he was going, and had power plant not failed to attach the required screen, Perry would not have been injured. Based on this, it can be said that Terry's conduct of falling, failing to see Dane and running into her just as she swung her club was a substantial factor in contributing to Perry's injuries. So we don't have the but-for cause, but we have the substantial factor test. Proximate cause. For Tommy to be the proximate cause of Perry's injuries, it must be shown that the type of harm sustained was reasonably foreseeable and that there was no intervening acts. Type of harm. When one causes a golf ball to go astray, one can reasonably expect to hit someone causing injury or to break a window or a parked car close by. However, because we are told that Perry lived 10 miles from the golf course, 
it could be argued that it would not be reasonable to expect someone to sustain injuries as a result of negligent conduct on Tommy's part while on the golf course. Additionally, he would not reasonably foresee that as a result of running into someone on the golf course, a golf ball would go into a power plant intake causing the plant to cease operations, resulting in Perry losing power to his equipment that supplied him with oxygen. Intervening Act The fact that power plant had failed to attach the required screen on the air intake would be considered an intervening act. For it to cut off Tommy's liability, it must be a type of act that was not foreseeable. An argument could be made that because this screen was a requirement, it was not foreseeable, a foreseeable intervening act. One would expect power plant to have the necessary equipment on their plant and follow what was required of them. However, because there are many instances in which people fail to follow requirements of them, this could be considered a foreseeable event, which would not cut off Tommy's liability. However, because the type of injury Perry suffered, because of the fact that he was 10 miles from the golf course, Tommy would not be found to be the proximate cause of Perry's in injuries, which would cause would, would cut off his liability for Perry's injuries. Had liability been established on Tommy's part, he could assert the defense of contributory negligence comparative fault. Okay, so that's true, but you notice he doesn't talk about superseding events or the domino theory or any of that. This is still passing. Contributory negligence. What, one must act reasonably and protect themselves from harm, comparative fault, see the contributory negligence. Very strong argument could be made that a reasonable person who relied on their oxygen to stay alive would have some type of backup plan to ensure their supply of oxygen was always available because there's no indication that Perry had a backup plan or acted in a reasonable manner to ensure that he had oxygen at all times. He could be found negligent and have contributed to his injuries. In a jurisdiction using contributory negligence, if Perry were found to have contributed to his injury through his own negligence, his recovery could be barred. In jurisdictions using comparative fault, a plaintiff's recovery would be just decreased by the amount of their own negligence is determined to have contributed to their injury. So do you see how one of these might be like a 70 and the other one might be like an 85? And you know, it, it's really, you know, and it doesn't have to be perfect. So if you want to uh, find this, I'll actually, I'll put this in here as a, uh, a link below if you want to go test yourself and do practice exams from there. But again, um, it really helps to have uh, extra support besides just going to school because being a lawyer and uh, pr passing the bar requires, uh, it's, it's, it's like a marathon, a triathlon. triathlon. So, um, that's going to be it for today. Uh, I think we've covered enough ground. I've expanded on proximate cause causation and reviewed a little bit of actual cause. And remember, uh, maybe I should just quickly review uh, what you need to have a negligence case. And it's three videos um, in the very beginning of Emerson going over the basics and also, in the first video on torts, he goes over the basics of all torts in general. Okay, so um, let's see. The four elements are duty, breach, causation, actual and proximate cause, and a harm or damages. Okay, well, thanks for listening. Uh, please like, share, and subscribe. Take care. Bye.